Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs>
Those shipments have been put on hold because of concerns about the chemical stability of the mixture in the containers that have arisen. Since so it was discovered that at least one drum from the Federal Los Alamos Laboratory may be behind the radiological leak at a repository at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site near Carlsbad, New Mexico. David Klaus, an Energy Department Secretary and Spokesmodel for Management and Performance, said in a statement, As we work to assess the conditions of the transuranic waste program at the Los Alamos lab, we have decided to halt further shipments until we can reassure the public that it is safe to do so, end quote. So, David, does that mean that the waste actually is safe or that it's just safe for you to put forth the talking points that have now been created to reassure the public that it is safe? Big difference there. A drum of radioactive waste from Los Alamos is suspected in the radiation leak, which occurred on February 14th at the WIP site, Underground Repository, for so-called low-level nuclear waste. But don't let that low level in the title fool you. This stuff is deadly. It consists of tools, rags, and other debris contaminated with radioisotopes such as plutonium from U.S. nuclear labs. Government investigators believe that a chemical reaction between nitrate salts and a new absorbent, cutely characterized as kitty litter to make it seem inoffensive, was likely what caused the drum to breach and eject materials onto a container nearby, which is a polite way of saying the damn thing exploded. Nuclear Hot Seat has been covering this story very closely, and if you wish to get the latest update, please listen to last week's episode, number 156, for our interview with nuclear watchdog Don Hancock. You can find it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under previous episodes, which is over on the right, scroll down on the home page, on the blog page, or you can find it on iTunes under podcasts. Speaking of the whip accident, which has the potential to get so much worse, two things to look at. They will both be linked on the website. One is a really terrific article from the Albuquerque Journal written by Lauren Viagran about the closure of whip casting a long shadow. And the other is a video done by our own Mila Reason, which is up on YouTube. It's about WIP and specifically focuses on the contention that no workers were harmed, when indeed 22 have been confirmed to have internal contamination from the radiation leak. And to the best of our knowledge, no adequate medical care has been provided to them. Go to the blog page under Nuclear Hot Seat number 157, this episode, and you'll be able to get links to both. Lame Duck Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner William Magwood has been called out as fatally compromised and urged to resign immediately by a coalition of 34 anti-nuclear and environmental groups. This is because of his apparent and actual conflict of interest. Several months ago, Magwood agreed to become Director General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Nuclear Energy Agency, which has an explicit mandate to promote nuclear power. His job there begins in September, and he has indicated he will leave the NRC before his term expires sometime this summer. But the coalition's letter to Magwood calls for his resignation now, and for him to retroactively recuse himself from any votes made in the past months after he began negotiating for the job at NEA. The letter was sent to the four other NRC commissioners, as well as to the White House and the U.S. Senate Oversight Committees. Why the hullabaloo? The NRC and its commissioners are not supposed to promote nuclear power, but rather to regulate its safety in order to protect the public and the environment even says so in their slogan. For a little nuke history lesson, when the Atomic Energy Commission was disbanded in the mid-1970s, it was because of the AEC's mandate to both promote and regulate nuclear energy. Big conflict of interest there. The NRC was then formed with the mandate to regulate safety, while the U.S. Department of Energy was given the job of promoting nuclear energy. Tellingly, Magwood directed the Department of Energy's Promotional Office of Nuclear Energy for several years 
as well as working in the nuclear industry itself before President Obama nominated him and the U.S. Senate confirmed him as an NRC commissioner. Whoosh! That's the sound of the nuclear revolving door. No word if Magwood is planning to retire from the NRC early, but I'm not holding my breath. In Southeast Washington state, Serious and sometimes fatal birth defects are showing up much more prevalently than anywhere else in the country. Benton, Franklin, and Yakima counties are being hit the hardest by neural tube defects from spina bifida to anencephaly, which is a fatal defect where a large part of the brain and or skull is missing. According to local Kennewick resident Candelaria Murillo, it's scary that the cause of this is such a mystery. The rate of babies being born without a brain in our part of the state is eight times the national average. In 2012, Yakima County alone experienced eight cases of anencephaly, when typically only one case would be expected all year. Health officials have discounted several possible causes, including pesticide exposure, nitrates in well water, and radiation from the Hanford nuclear reactor. Wait a minute, slow down, and let's take a look at this elephant in the living room. Hanford is that leaking waste repository filled with leftover radioactive detritus from World War II's atomic bomb program located in Benton County. Benton's in the middle, Franklin's to the east, Yakima's to the west. This is where the anencephaly and spina bifida cluster has appeared. So who are these experts to discount Hanford as a possible source of the contamination when it's well known that one of the side effects of exposure to depleted uranium, meaning radiation, is neural tube defect in newborn children? Another place with an even higher rate of neural tube defects? Fallujah, Iraq, where we, the United States, set off weapons that contained depleted uranium. It's a long-term way of defeating your enemy forever. Now, even while some of those quote-unquote experts are trying to cover the Hanford butt, other experts, genuine experts, are speaking out, criticizing the state health department for not doing enough to save babies' lives. The Washington Department of Health has steadfastly refused to interview the parents of these babies and has failed to accept offers of help from world-renowned anencephaly experts. Richard Finnell, a pediatric geneticist and birth defect expert at the University of Texas, said that to find the cause of this cluster, state investigators need to speak with the parents of children with birth defects, but that the state of Washington has not contacted these parents. A team of experts offered to help Washington investigators back in February, but hasn't even received a response. Why is this? According to state epidemiologist Julia Van Enwick, it's very intrusive to start knocking on doors of people who've had a pretty major trauma in their lives. But Billy Peterson, reflecting the viewpoint of several families interviewed by CNN whose children had the neural tube defect, said, that's the lamest excuse I've ever heard. We want to talk to them, he said. We'd do anything to help find out why our baby died and help other families. We don't want anyone else to go through what we've been through. Nuclear Hot Seat has been covering this story since episode 111 on July 30th of 2013. And we would like to acknowledge the courage of the CBS affiliate KEPR, Keeper, which is located in Pasco, Washington, one of the Tri-Cities, which includes Kennewick and Richland. They did an excellent report on this on May 14th of this year. And the reason that it took so much courage is that they are located in one of the three cities, the Tri-City area, that is directly adjacent to the Hanford site. And Hanford is the primary economic base for the entire area. This is news reporting with guts. Thanks to Riverkeeper.org for bringing our attention to a story about an Indian Point supporter who has had second thoughts. Andy Revkin of the New York Times has been one of the Indian Point nuclear power plant's most prominent supporters, but he seems to have growing doubts about New York's aging nuclear neighbor to the north. 
On June 12, Revkin published an entry on his influential online New York Times blog, Dot Earth, with the provocative title, Indian Point's Tritium Problem and the NRC's Regulatory Problem. Revkin referred to a recent increase in the observed levels of radioactive tritium in the groundwater beneath Indian Point, adjacent to the plant's spent fuel pools. He asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for comment about this disturbing news and also queried David Lockbaum, director of the Nuclear Safety Project at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Revkin wrote that he agrees with Lockbaum on the need for significant changes in the nuclear plant oversight and quotes Lockbaum as saying, the NRC should enforce its regulations or change its name. In follow-up communications with Riverkeeper, Revkin backed down from completely condemning Indian Point. But progress has been made, a step has been taken by a very influential individual, and we're looking for more of the same across the board. A fascinating article, and we will post a link on the website. Over to Japan, where cows from Fukushima had developed white dots on their skin. And this only showed up after the Fukushima nuclear plant went into meltdown. A hibaku gyu, or irradiated cow, was brought by two farmers, Masami Yoshizawa from Name Town and Naoto Matsumura from Tomioka Town, both of them in Fukushima Prefecture. The cow's body shows one-inch dots all over, which might have correlation to nuclear radiation, according to the farmers, since these cows were fed with irradiated grains. The farmers brought the cow to the Ministry of Environment and to the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. On Friday, June 20th, they protested at the ministries as well as near the Prime Minister's building. According to the Japan Times, Farmer Yoshizawa says many animals in Fukushima have developed the speckles and demanded that the government investigate it. He said, the ministry told us they don't know what is causing the spots. Well, they need to do more research and figure it out. They can't just run away saying they don't know. Farmer Matsumura said, what if this started happening to people? We have to examine the cause of this and let people know what happened to these animals. Mr. Yoshizawa concurred, saying, first you abandon the lives of these creatures, then you will abandon the lives of humans. Sounds pretty accurate to me. We'll have a picture of that speckled cow up on our website, and believe me, that's no bull. Now here's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, None Nuts Out of Week. Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe Baby, who's been looking a little peaked these days. I think he's having a difficult time at home with his anti-nuclear wife, Akie, not necessarily making things easy for him. In any event, Prime Minister Abebebe and the Science and Technology Minister of Japan have agreed to set up an integrated research center for dig it, more rapid decommissioning of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Uh, what's wrong with the wording in this pro-nuclear piece of propaganda? It's more than three years later. The word rapid doesn't belong anywhere in this announcement. And as for decommissioning, you can only decommission an intact nuclear reactor. What you have at Fukushima is a hot mess, a radioactive pile of rubble and corium and spent fuel that isn't spent enough because it's still got plenty of cash in there that can fry us all on the planet. Be that as it may, Abe Bibi and Science and Technology Minister Hakubun Shimomura agreed to establish the International Joint Research Center in April of next year. Did you say rapid? April of next year is more than four years after the disaster began. Guys, you're moving so slow, you're just about going backwards. Well, they also agreed that the government of Japan needs to take the lead in the project. Yeah, you can't risk any of that nuclear truth actually getting out to the people. The new center plans to invite leading researchers and engineers from universities and research institutes in Japan and foreign countries. 
No word yet when the engraved invitations are going to be sent to Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education, Dr. Marvin Resnikoff, who is Senior Advisor at Radioactive Waste Management Associates, or today's guest, nuclear engineer Ernest Goyton. That's because the last thing Abe Baby or his science and technology minister want to hear is the truth about Fukushima. Finally, at this new center, experts who have handled nuclear accidents overseas will give classes on what they learn. What's the matter? Freeconferencecall.com does not exist in Japan. You can't use the internet or Skype it together so that we can get the information now. You've got to wait until you form an institute and it's a year later and it's four years since Fukushima started. I guess they don't want to be exposed as the sociopathic, genocidal idiots that they are, especially in advance of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. And that's why this week, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby of Japan has once again earned the right to proudly state that he is nuclear hot seat, none that's not awake. For our international roundup, a little bit of good news from down under. The Australian government will not proceed to establish a national radioactive waste management facility at Muckety Station after the Northern Land Council, the NLC, withdrew its nomination of the site. What's important about this is that the NLC is a group of Aboriginal peoples, and they have gotten the right to their own land back. In 2007, Australian legislation required that potential sites for radioactive waste management facilities must be voluntarily nominated and that people or groups with relevant rights and interests must agree on the nomination. Some traditional owners, that's what the Aboriginals are called in Australia, not First Nations like in Canada or Native Americans like here, well, Native Australians, but traditional owners subsequently launched legal proceedings against the NLC and two weeks into a federal court hearing on the allegations against it, the NLC announced that it had withdrawn its nomination. Woohoo! Australian Industry Minister Ian McFarlane then issued a statement confirming that the government would not go ahead with the muckety nomination. This marks an extraordinary win for the elders and their families who have sought to protect the country on behalf of all of its citizens. The successful activists have stated that it is essential that Australia's disgraceful history of targeting Aboriginal communities to host their 60-year legacy of spent reactor fuel is never repeated again. Congratulations. In Russia, the government has declared war on an ecological defense organization for resisting construction of a nuclear power plant near Kaliningrad. On Monday, June 16, Russia's Eco-Defense, the leading anti-nuclear power organization in the country, was branded a foreign agent by the Russian government. Under Russian law adopted recently, nonprofit organizations that fail to register as a foreign agent but are found to be one can be subject to large fines and dissolution of the organization. While Eco-Defense is part of the international NEARS WISE network, coordinated in part by the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, the organization was founded in Russia, is based in Russia, and has focused on issues affecting Russia. It has, for those reasons, refused to register as a foreign agent, which in Russia is tantamount to an admission that the organization is controlled from abroad and effectively is undertaking espionage activities on behalf of other nations, neither of which is true in the case of eco-defense. The organization states, our goal is to protect the environment and people, and we intend to use all legal avenues at our disposal to defend our honest name in court. Here's hoping that is still possible in Putin's Russia. And finally, this story from France. Last year, eight children traveled from Koryama and Fukushima City in Fukushima Prefecture to France for two weeks as part of a recuperation program launched by Yoshino Hiroyuki-san of Fukushima Network for Saving Children from Radiation. 
These recuperation programs are extremely important to the children as it stops their continual exposure to radiation, allows them to cleanse their body of the radioactive cesium, and reacquaint them with nature and the joy of playing outside. Simple things that we all take for granted, but back home, they are still bound to play only a few minutes outside daily because of the radiation risks. Eight or more children will return to the south of France this summer and enjoy cultural exchange once again. They will be hosted in a serene environment and will partake of many fun outdoor activities, including horseback riding. The emphasis will be on rediscovery of a healthy diet and lifestyle. Last year, the stay was 15 days, and this year, again, it will be that length. Translators, a nurse, a doctor, and other volunteers will be present for the duration. This is the same concept as the Comoro home stay, which was featured in Nuclear Hot Seat number 155 two weeks ago, necessary to allow at least some of the children from Fukushima to have a shot at normalcy, even for a short time. And we will post a link so that you can learn more about this program and how you can support it. We'll be moving on to our interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat continues to reach out to people around the world, especially in Japan with our Voices from Japan series. With our ever-increasing audience comes ever-increasing bandwidth charges to support all the downloads, plus our usual website charges and a whole slew of expenses that must be met to keep this program running. If you have donated to help us before, many thanks and you have my gratitude. If you haven't donated yet, or if you'd like to help out again, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping keep this program alive so that you can keep up to date with all things anti-nuclear. Whatever you can do to help. Many thanks. This week, for our interview, we revisit an interview from back in the dark ages of Nuclear Hot Seat, number 23, from November 15 of 2011. That's when I first spoke with nuclear engineer Ernest Goyton. Ernie, as he prefers to be called, worked for companies designing power plant equipment, boilers, condensers, cooling towers, before he ran up a 17-year stint with Bechtel in San Francisco. His last 10 years at Bechtel, he was project manager for the Trojan Nuclear Power Plant in Oregon, that was from 1970 to 75, and project engineer for Skagit Nuclear Power Plant in Washington from 1976 to 1979. The good news for us is that Ernie quit Bechtel in 1981 after attending a Black Hills conference on nuclear issues. He's been involved since then in many environmental campaigns, including the 10-year struggle to save Ward Valley in California from becoming a low-level radioactive waste dump. Note that because this interview is from two and a half years ago, a few references need clarification. Ernie mentions at one point that there are 104 active nuclear power plants in the U.S., where now, because we've managed to get four of them shut down, there are 100. When he says last year, it refers to 2010. And when he speaks about the North Anna nuclear power plants located in Virginia, these plants were less than 10 miles from the epicenter of the August 23, 2011 East Coast earthquake that registered 5.8 on the Richter scale. But what I found truly amazing about this interview was a gem contained within it about climate change and the connection to nuclear, something that has not been part of our conversation and definitely deserves to be a talking point. Nuclear engineer, Ernest Goyton. You were a nuclear industry insider. What made you, first of all, attend that Black Hills Conference on Nuclear Issues? And what happened at that conference to make you change your position so radically? Well, what made me go well, were a bunch of uh, Native women from Arizona and Navajo who were talking about the effects of uh, the mine, uranium mining in their community. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned that there was going to be a conference in the, on the back hill near a farm of Marvin Kemmerer, 
And so we camped out there for a week. And we had people from France, from Germany, from uh, Canada, all sorts of people with good information about nuclear issues. And it resulted in my changing my mind. And I couldn't continue working in nuclear power with the effects of radiation, particularly on Native people from the mining, as well as uh, the potential of a disaster. Could you give us a more in-depth perspective on what is the impact of nuclear power plants? Let's start with global warming. What relationship, if any, do you see between the nuclear reactors and global warming? The basic thing that's not mentioned often is that the efficiency of nuclear power plants is about 20% lower than that of fossil fuel plants. That is because the steam that goes through the turbine is saturated steam. That is the steam that comes off boiling water, even if it's at high pressure. That's about 540 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas in a fossil fuel plant, that temperature is like 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That means it's superheated. And with the steam that comes off boiling water is heated some more. And then it's reheated again halfway through the turbine. So that, in effect, the efficiency of a fossil plant can be as high as 56%, whereas a nuclear plant is more in the order of 35%. So that's a 20% difference. Where does that 20% go? Well, it goes into the environment. It's rejected into the water or the air, the rivers or the ocean. In effect, it adds to global warming and it results in climate change, aside from being harmful to fish and other marine life. It is never mentioned that it has a significant effect, particularly if you consider that 20% of all electric energy is from nuclear plants. 20% of 20% means 5% of all electric energy is rejected to the environment from nuclear power plants. It's a significant number. I've never heard that before. Now, is this generally known, and uh, has this been the case ever since the start of nuclear power plants going online? Yes, of course. There weren't as many nuclear power plants 40 years ago as there are now, but there are 104 plants running. It's not discussed often. What is mentioned is there's no carbon emission, which is also not quite true, because when nuclear power started, they used the gaseous diffusion system for enriching uranium. And that was not very efficient, so that about 25% of the energy created in nuclear power plants was needed to uh, enrich the uranium. Since then, the uh, centrifugal units are more efficient, quite a bit more efficient, so that's no longer a case, but it was a case for a long time. Now, the nuclear industry is fond of pointing out how, and I put this in quotes, safe nuclear energy is. Yet, we know the stories that we know about many near misses and, unfortunately, the accidents that have made the headlines. But even though we're long past Halloween, what kind of scary stories can you tell us about major accidents that almost happened? The one I'm thinking of is the davis Bessie plan for Toledo Edison in Toledo, Ohio, you use a uh, boric acid enriched moisture to control the reaction, the neutron generation, to control the reaction basically. Well, on the reactor head, there was a leak in one of the small supply lines, and that leak was not detected. So the boric acid solution ate into the reactor head and ate all the way through the uh, steel of the reactor head. And the only thing that stopped it from a catastrophe was a quarter-inch stainless steel liner, which had bulged out through the uh, cavity that's been corroded. And if that had gone, it would have been a total disaster, not only for Toledo, but Lake Erie, and who knows how far. 
it was discovered during an annual inspection, but it must have been overlooked in earlier inspections. Right, that doesn't sound like the kind of damage that could be done in a single year. Yeah, we're talking about corroding through four-inch steel. So that was a real near miss. Subsequent to this, at that same plant, last year they discovered a series of hairline cracks at penetration into the head where the control rods go through. So they had to, last year they decided, well, they had to replace the head, and they brought in a new head. To do this, they had to put a big hole in the, in the containment. It's a concrete containment. And they cut the hole, put the new reactor head in, the replacement head in, and sealed the hole. And now, as I think last month, they found cracks in the concrete containment. So <laughs> one thing led to another. The Davis Bessie accident, a potential accident, was really the worst possible scenario that I could think of. And how long ago was that caught? That was in 2002 when it was discovered, and the recent hairline crack that were discovered last year, October 2010. We have an aging fleet of online nuclear reactors. Most of them are 30 years old or older. They were only designed for a 40-year lifespan, even though the majority of them seem to be getting 20-year and 30-year license extensions from the NRC. And I'm wondering what the impact of aging is on nuclear reactors. The most recognized problem, potential problem, is the embrittlement of the steel caused by the uh, neutron bombardment that makes it makes the steel more brittle. So if you have a uh, sudden thermal shock, like if you have a scram... Uh, a scram? Can you explain what that is? Oh, yes. When you push a button in, in case of an emergency and the control rods come in and the reaction, the fission stops, that doesn't mean heat is, isn't still generated from heat decay, but the fission reaction stops. And frequently it's also associated with a rapid cool down. That means temperature change, which in turn causes stresses on that massive vessel. And that's a danger that it could result in failures. Is there any way while the reactors are up and running to test for embrittlement to find out if the seal is in danger of rupture or crumbling or whatever it's going to do if it, if it gives way? What they do is they use sample pieces of steel that they expose to that kind of radiation and then uh, test those periodically and see how the embrittlement has changed. This is well documented. I mean, the degree of increased embrittlement. So we know it happens. How much further we want to go, I don't know, but uh, it's not good to uh, extend it into the unknown for another 20 years. Mm -hmm. The other one is the structure itself is basically out of concrete, reinforced concrete, and concrete changes in time. It becomes stronger at first, of course, very rapidly for the first 30 days or so, but then it keeps getting stronger which means that the way the building reacts to earthquake motions also changes. It's a complicated structure, it's a complicated analysis. It doesn't mean that the structure would fail by any means, but it means how the structure moves during an earthquake. And that makes a difference to the pipe and electric trays that are supported inside the structure, particularly at higher levels. Very delicate, Thing. These are long lines, and you've got to avoid a resonance in the lines, That's like a violin string. You want to avoid that effect. And so there are snubbers and restraints of all sorts. It's a very tedious, long calculation in the design of the plant. Well, that's all changing. I mean, the input 
of assuming a certain motion in the building is changing with time. Never uh, brought out or analyzed, but I think it could be it could result in damage, and who knows where. Well, that brings up the point about North Anna, which two nuclear reactors, one's 30 years old, one's 32 years old, less than 10 miles from epicenter, shaken to twice their design specifications. And yet, as of last Friday, the NRC said, after having examined one of the plants, not both of them, said, oh, they're fine, let's bring them back online. What's your take on that? What kind of insights can you provide us on, on that decision? I doubt whether they looked at the uh, change in the concrete strength and the effect on the the resonance of how the world building behaves. I doubt it very much. The other thing, North Anna, I believe, is a Westinghouse unit. It's a pressurized water reactor. What effect does it have on moving the rods up and down, the control rods inside the containment, if there's been a shaking, if there's been an obstruction? Uh, it is a problem with uh, General Electric reactors where the control rods come in from the bottom. I really don't know, but it's something that should be examined. Given that you were exposed to information about the Indian tribes and then about the other dangers and damages that happen from nuclear radiation and from the industry to the point where you realized you could not continue, what, in your estimation, do you think it will take to provide a similar awakening for the commissioners on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the people in Congress and elsewhere who think that nuclear energy is a really spiffy thing and we should keep going with it? I think there's a connection between the weapons industry and the power plant industry. The nuclear power plant industry is already complaining that they do not have sufficient new talent to design and operate the plants because young people aren't particularly interested in that field anymore. And so they have to uh, go out and advertise and provide the scholarships at universities to uh, entice people to go into that field. The nuclear weapons component also is dependent upon people that are interested in working in a nuclear field. So there is an interconnection between the two. Right now, the brightest and the best are probably those from the nuclear Navy who um, do get an excellent training. I think the cost is another item. The amount of subsidies that the government is trying to push down the throat of the public to support or to subsidize nuclear power is huge. If that same amount of money were spent on renewable energy, the problem would be solved. Mm -hmm. but the interest is not so much in solving the problems as to stay on a nuclear field. Ernie, I know that there is so much more information that you could share with us. I first of all want to thank you for being on the podcast today and invite you back at some future date not too far away to continue because it's like having our own California-based Arnie Gunderson here in getting this information for you with the clarity and the specificity of it. So I hope you will agree to come back and be on the program again. Surely. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this whole program. It's very informative and I'm glad to be part of it. That was nuclear engineer Ernie Goyden from Nuclear Hot Seat Number 23 in an interview that originally aired on November 15, 2011. Revisiting Ernie's comments about global warming and its connection to nuclear is amazingly well-timed. That's because it has just been announced that on September 20 and 21st, there will be a People's Climate March in New York City held in advance of the UN Climate Summit on September 23rd. The march is to join together all the people, individuals, and organizations who wish to have a call for immediate action on climate, economic, and health issues. Nuclear Information and Resource Service has put out a call to all anti-nuclear groups and stray individuals, that would be me, to come to New York for the march. 
Earlier today, I spoke with NEAR's Executive Director, Tim Judson, to get more information. Tim, why is it that NEAR has put out a call for anti-nuclear groups to rally along with others at the People's Climate March in New York this fall? NEARS believes that the climate action is one of the most important issues facing us, both as, a, as the anti-nuclear movement and the broader evil entity movement. And uh, we know that the nuclear isn't the solution to climate change, but we think it's also important to stand with everybody else who's working towards the same carbon-free, nuclear-free energy future uh, to deliver this message as one massive movement. So we're going to be working with the grassroots groups across the country to uh, mobilize all of our folks to turn out and to be part of this tremendous outpouring of support for climate action. What has been the biggest misconception within the climate change action community regarding nuclear? Well, I think actually a lot of people in the climate action movement may even be anti-nuclear themselves, but I think that there has been a perception that the nuclear, you know, isn't really relevant to uh, the climate action. There, I think there's been some national groups who have sort of bought into the narrative that nuclear is a low-carbon resource and shouldn't really be part of the discussion around what our climate solutions are. What we're seeing now is actually a real opportunity to help the rest of the climate action movement to understand the relevance of nuclear. Because in the last few months, the nuclear industry has launched a nationwide campaign to revamp energy policy, to make nuclear the preferred energy source, and actually to undercut, and in some cases, stop renewables from advancing. And what we saw recently in the release of the EPA's new carbon pollution rules, there's actually a lot of subsidies for nuclear in there. And we're concerned uh, that the nuclear industry is going to try to exploit this rule as a way to essentially work itself into clean energy standards in states around the country and sell emissions credits to coal and gas power plants and crowd out renewables by locking in essentially our current energy system. How do you see this rally as being important to bring about a shift in awareness within the climate change movement regarding nuclear? I think the rally itself is an opportunity for us to all to stand together and for our movement by being there to have conversations with everyone else who attends about what we're working on and, and, and how our issue relates to what they're doing. What we're going to be doing in the next few months in organizing and leading up to the climate rally is the really crucial work of both getting the word out to the, uh, the grassroots anti-nuclear movement about what the industry is doing and especially what they're trying to do through the carbon rule to be able to be connecting with the other arms of the climate action movement to help them understand the threat of the nuclear industry is doing poses to the, the, the even the possibility of the U.S. meeting any kind of real carbon reduction and climate action agenda. Are we going to have a speaker at the rally who is able to address these issues? It's actually not clear that there's actually going to be a rally at the climate march. I think a lot of the details of what the event is going to look like are still being formed. But I think what we've heard from some of the groups on the ground in New York City is that the march is going to be just that. It's going to be a march uh, where we can all stand together with one united voice. And everyone is probably going to be holding their own side events and theater marches and focusing on their own issues. Uh, but I, I think that there, there, there may not actually be a big uh, rally with speakers at the event itself. Going forward after the rally has been held, what does NEARS intend to do to spread the information about the nuclear industry's attempt to really rig the system so that they can be the preferred energy provider? What are you going to be doing to get that information out, and how might we support you? We're actually already doing it. We're, we've got a national petition going uh, online. You can get it at NEARS' website, www.nirs.org. We've already got over 10,000 signatures on this petition telling EPA to take nuclear out of the carbon rule. And so we're going to be promoting that petition up until the march, and we're going to be promoting it afterward. There's a 120-day public comment period on the EPA's carbon rule, which is going to be wrapping up sometime in October. And so, uh, you know, we're going to be, you know, both promoting the petition all the way through and encouraging people to submit uh, written comments to EPA, declaring their opposition to having nuclear declared part of the climate solution. And we'll be doing also sign-on letters for everybody's organizations to join us in sending that message loud and clear to EPA. 
As this proceeds, please keep Nuclear Hot Seat informed. We would love to cover your progress and do everything we can to support getting the biggest possible turnout there September 20th and 21st. Thank you, Lady. We'll keep you posted. That was Tim Judson, Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NIRS. The Coalition Against Nukes is working directly with NIRS to support a large turnout by anti-nuclear activists at the People's Climate March. We will have further information from CAN founder Priscilla Starr and her crew in the coming weeks. So do you like to read? If so, have I got a book for you. It's called Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. And it's written by yours truly. It's the true story of what it's like to find oneself accidentally in proximity to a leaking nuclear reactor with no way to escape. Truly the embodiment of the Bonnie Raitt song, Ain't Nowhere You Can Run, No, 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 Ain't Nowhere You Can Run. It's published as an ebook, which is available on Amazon Kindle, and you can download Kindle software to be able to use it on any digital device. You can check out a free excerpt by going to the website, nuclearhotseat.com, look for the big yellow box, put in your first name and email address, I promise you I will not spam you, and in return email you will get a PDF from a chapter that takes me from landing at the Harrisburg airport five days before the Three Mile Island nuclear accident began to being trapped in my friend's house after evacuation had been announced via bullhorn, only I had no way to evacuate. Great fun, bedtime reading. Should it ever get turned into a film, I know it will be a blast. Hey, after this shout out time, Myla Reason has another excellent video up on YouTube. This one on um, the whip situation in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and it focuses on the health of the workers who were internally contaminated by plutonium and americium from the February 14 radiation link. Myla does great work, so we will link to her video on the website nuclearhotseat.com. And a domo arigato to the indefatigable Umi Hagatani for additional information she provided about the irradiated cows from Fukushima. John Stewart, I'm starting to think you don't care. You know you need me. You know you want me. You know I'm the best possible nuclear pundit for The Daily Show. All you have to do is call. I'll be there. Yes, I will. You've got a friend. And also a nuclear pundit. And if you don't want me on the air, Booby, it's okay. I'll write it. You'll pay me. You'll get one of your other people to deliver it. Or, honey, you can do it yourself. But it's time your listeners got the skinny on nuclear. We'll talk. Here's today's final thought. With the World Cup, whatever that is, said the non-sports watching woman, Anyway, with the World Cup bringing the countries of the world together to commit organized war without guns on each other, it brings to mind what will be wrought when the 2020 Olympics happen, if they are still at that point scheduled for Tokyo. Sports feed insane nationalism, ancient rivalries, bad behavior, and violence that often doesn't end with a referee's whistle. And that's just in the stands. Wouldn't it be great if all that passion, that energy, that caring could be funneled into something more substantial? What if all those people currently cheering on their national teams turned up at an anti-nuclear rally? What if only 1% of the international audience for the World Cup turned up at a no-nukes rally? Wouldn't that just change the world? But the pro-nuke propaganda just keeps rolling along. For example, the chef for the Japanese squad at the FIFA World Cup in Brazil plans to fly a few hundred kilograms of fish, including sablefish and mackerel, from Japan to Brazil for his team. This according to a story posted earlier this month by the Japan News. Of course, this chef also runs a restaurant back home that feeds workers from the ever-dangerous Fukushima nuclear power plant mess. So he knows which side his sushi is wasabi on. Chef Yoshitiro Nishi said, 
If the national team plays good games, I believe devastated areas will become lively once more, which will lead to their restoration. To make that happen, I'd like to fight alongside them in the kitchen and play an important supporting role for them. The story noted that Nishi planned to source most of the ingredients for the team's World Cup meals in Sao Paulo, where there's an, according to him, abundance of Japanese ingredients in the supermarkets. So from this little World Cup human interest story, we know that Japanese world-class athletes are being fed fish that have a high probability of being contaminated by radiation. That Brazil does not test its Japanese food imports for possible radiation contamination. And that the Japanese government's brainwashing is so intense that its citizens haven't a clue about the dangers of radiation and its impact upon the food chain, and so have become willing to participate in the ongoing poisoning of even their most prized athletic citizens. If any of these athletes have ingested so much as a tiny radioactive particle, a hot particle, it will most likely take 10 to 12 years at the shortest for them to develop hard tumors and the other illnesses that result from internal contamination. This will be long after the world may have been snookered into attending the radioactive Olympics in 2020, and long after this mm -mm good Japanese fish was eaten by the World Cup athletes so that they don't make the connection between the two. That's what the nuclear industry counts on. So where's the outrage? Where's the anger? If all those fans knew that the food choices of their team's chef could be putting their beloved athletes at risk for internal radiation contamination and its attendant cancer, heart disease, immune system diseases, reproductive problems, a.k.a. your sperm count guys, would they react, take a stand, put some energy into changing the nuclear situation back home? Or are they simply so happy their team is scarfing down fresh sushi and playing in the World Cup that they're not concerned about the larger implications? Another tsunami is coming to hit Japan. This one is slow moving, yet inevitable, massive, and life destroying. It is the nuclear contamination, the radiation, which will catch up with the Japanese people. And before long, the numbers affected will be too high to be hidden anymore. At that point, imported sushi and homegrown ingredients and even the World Cup may prove less than compelling to those directly affected. But of course, by then it will be too late. This is, unfortunately, one game that no team, no side, no nation, and no species can win. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 24, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Reuters, the Albuquerque Journal, Beyond Nuclear, NEARS, KEPR-TV, AP, Oregon Public Broadcasting, CNN, Riverkeeper.org, AFP, Japan Times, greensmps.org.au, safeenergy.org, evacuatefukushimanow.wordpress.com, Bayshore News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, and a greater group of anti-nuclear activists, let alone human beings, you could never hope to meet. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilyn Lee Weaver. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We are now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays, just to scramble up your sense of sequence. We are also on AirProgressive.com, not AirAmerica.com, as I've mistakenly said in the past few weeks. Projection on my part? We'll see. Our archive is available on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts. You can also find them on the newly searchable website, nuclearhotseat.com. When in doubt, go to the blog page, scroll down, knock yourself out. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Harvestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. 
It is permissible to reuse for nonprofit purposes as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. If you're for profit, let's talk syndication. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Thank <laughs> you.